Hi everybody, welcome to London College Communication. Note the necklace, please. Uh, my name's Natalie Brett. I'm um, Head of College and Pro Vice Chancellor here. Uh, we've got a few stragglers coming in. Come on, you lot, get in, sit down. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to uh, welcome Robert Elms here tonight, who is talking to our fantastic Professor Tom Hunter. Uh, welcome to those of you that are not part of this college, but this is an amazing community of staff and students, and Tom is a fine example of that. He graduated from here, we were just doing the numbers, 20 years ago. He started... <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, I bet you're students, aren't you? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and he's been working here for, we think, probably about 14 or 15 years and has played a major part in the development of photography in this college and also, you know, fantastic tutor for our students. He got his professorship, how many years ago? I can't remember. Uh, last year, was it? Was it, was it last year or two years? Can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, fairly recent, yeah. Yeah, uh, fairly which is an amazing and deserved accolade for Tom. We're going to be, uh, Rob, Robert here is going to be in conversation with Tom. Robert, a uh, well-known writer and broadcaster, as I'm sure many of you know, a very interesting history as well within the culture, particularly in London, I would say, certainly with my memory. I've got a long memory of the stuff that Robert's been writing and speaking about for a very long time. Uh, Tom's quite nervous about this tonight, strangely. However, Robert's done this before with him, so I think we're up for a very interesting evening. There will be an opportunity for questions and answers. I should say as well, actually, I forgot to say this bit, we have great relationships here too. This is a good friend for LCC, and in fact, both wife and daughter have attended college here. <laughs> so back to that fantastic community stuff. In fact, Tom was my daughter's teacher. So. Yeah, there you go. So, good stuff. So, Rob knows us very well as well, so that's really good. There will be a chance for question and answers at the end, which I think um, you're going to try and sort of bat yeah. them about, aren't you? Uh, but thank you, and please enjoy. Thank you. As was mentioned, I've, I've talked to Tom many times before, actually, because I think he's one of the most astute chroniclers of my city. I was going to say my city, but it's our city, and maybe the city that many of us share, which is quite remarkable, because, of course, he's a country boy. Um, and he arrived here to cut down trees, I believe, but he clearly came with a camera, and since then, I think, has managed to portray and see our city in a way that, that many don't, and has managed to see the, the extraordinary beauty, often I think, in, in places that others would dismiss. And I think for that, as a city, we owe this man quite a lot, which is the reason I'm here tonight, because I think his work is fantastic, and I think also as a, an educator, he's a fantastic example. When you first arrived here, Tom, did you have aspirations to be a photographer, or was it just a hobby, or, or what? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, my father had a, a darkroom in our in our garden, our backyard. Um, so there was that amazing tunnel that you go in this strange doorway. You have to turn right and then turn left and turn right, and that amazing red glow. If any of you are old enough to remember the red glow in that little darkroom, I remember um, red glows in rooms in Soho, but that okay, was very yeah. different. slightly <laughs> different, slightly <laughs> different. Yeah. Um, so I did. I do remember taking my first picture of my sister. Um, and I do remember going into that sort of, that magical world through the tunnel into that red light, putting the paper under the enlarger, then into the paper, swishing that tray, and then the face coming out of that, those waters. It's like alchemy, isn't it's it? It's alchemy. It's witchcraft. You felt like a witch swishing away, making your magic spell. And the image came out, my, fist, my sister's face came out of these murky waters. Um, and I, it did stick there, but then I got lost in juvenile delinquency, <laughs> punk rock, um, motorbikes, chasing, chasing rabbits and girls, um, living in the forest. Did you catch either of them? <laughs> I caught lots of, yeah, coming back from the pub on a Saturday night, we used to catch lots of rabbits, um, which, 
Yeah, and a few pheasants, and I did live on those. But suitable sort of, uh, survival week, I think, because uh, I did live off the land with mushrooms and rabbits and pheasants. Um, and then, yeah, I came to London um, through sort of a strange quirk, really, but my tool was a chainsaw rather than a camera, so it was, yeah, I sort of forgot about all those sort of cultural things and was sort of, sort of just living a life, really. Now, the, the, the title tonight is Home, and it seems to me that home has always been almost a theme of your work running from the very beginning, the, the idea of chronicling home and finding home and seeking it out in unusual places. The, the, the first pictures that you did of the squats in Hackney and all of that, were you consciously doing that? Um, yeah, I, I, I was conscious of documenting something. Um, and that happened in my wilder youth as well. I mean, it wasn't particularly wild, but uh, being uh, sort of 13, 14, 15, 16, those sort of ages... You were a bit older. You were sort of much in, much more... Well, you were in London at the time yeah. with that punk thing going on. I was out in the provinces where we heard about things, a punk record, and a year later it actually got <laughs> down to Dorset. It would actually hear a Sex Pistols record two years later after it actually got released. But there was an amazing tribalism, as you know, in the 70s yeah. and 80s, where my friends were skinheads, they were punks, they were teddy boys, they were bikers, they were mods... And that amazing culture did sort of strike with me until two friends died in a motorbike accident. And that really sort of hit home. Um, and, then, and then leaving that, I had no record. I've got no photographs of that time. I've got no, no photographic records of all that amazing identity. And in this book, I've got some pictures. I was looking on the internet and looking back at those pictures. And we all looked the same, didn't we? All the stupid haircuts, stupid ripped jeans and all these funny clothes. But... So um, I wanted to document it because I realised as soon as I moved into a squat, I thought, wow, this is incredible. I've never lived in such a beautiful big house. See, beautiful is a strange word because okay, yeah. the place that you were living in Hackney yeah. was described as you know, murder mile yeah. and a den of iniquity and all of that. Yeah. And yet you saw beauty in it. Yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, it was described as ghettos and why people want to live here. And, uh, but yeah, I've always had these weird glasses on, these rose tinted glasses where I've always seen... The beauty. Um, I, wrote, I, mean, I am a romantic in that way. You know, I do find it incredibly hard going upstairs and seeing my show and someone's made a film of the people on the buses. I can't even go in there. I can't see it. It's too... Oh, I, the pictures I make, I want to show the beautiful things. I show the, the life around me I'm attracted to. The, yeah. the pictures up there that, that in the exhibition are very different from the pictures that you kind of became famous for doing later, I suppose. They're much more chronicling and capturing. They're almost photojournalism of a kind, I guess. It's moving images, it's moments. And how did you make that transformation from that style of photography to the more considered approach that you adopted later, do you think? I mean, yeah, that was a sort of process. One, one of it was frustration with the photographic medium itself. Really? Um, I didn't think it was telling the audience what I wanted to say um, when I was taking... Even the pictures, I made a 3D photographic model of the street I was squatting in to document that before... Which is in the Museum of London, isn't it? That's right, it's on permanent display there now. Um, And it it documented, and then I found that's all it did. It didn't tell the story I wanted to say, I felt. Funny enough, now looking back on 20 years, I can actually see that the documentary pictures do tell the story. But then I I thought there was an inadequacy in straight documentary photography. There's something missing, there's something lacking from it. So I was desperately searching to find something. And then I came across people like Jeff Wall, who were weaving a narrative and a political contents into their images, which I found really exciting. So I thought, actually, I've got to stage these pictures to tell the deeper layers and the deeper meanings that I really wanted to talk about. I felt very under threat as well, living in, living in squats, living, becoming a traveller, I felt as though there was a barrage of images, mainstream images, in the national press, which were telling me that I was an outsider, I wasn't part of society, and I should be seen as other, not quite proper, almost you know, like the gays were treated, like different subgroups have, have been treated within society. And I thought, well, you know, I might be a bit of an outsider, I might be a weird, but I do consider myself to be part of society. And in that way, I'm a, you know, I'm a socialist. I want to, I want to contribute. There's always been a political element of your work, hasn't yeah. there? Yeah, that is very important for me, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and staging photography seems to be a way of bringing in the beauty of photography and the, 
the accessibility of photography. Photography is an amazing medium that we all, even though some of us have never taken a photograph. I've only ever taken one in my entire life. That's absolutely true. But we all believe we understand photography. We all, we all look at magazines. We all see newspapers. We all see the TV screen. We all see the internet. And we all have this connection with photography, our window into the, world, the real world. And that's what I do love about photography. It's, it's, it's the reality of it. When you, made the choice, when you made the choice to come here and actually study it and do it properly, were you consciously thinking, I'm going to be a photographer? Was that...? Yeah, yeah, that was it. I, 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 made, uh, I made that conscious leap. I, I, I went off hitchhiking. I was two years as a tree surgeon in the Royal Parks. And then I went hitching around America for six, seven months. And in that time, I thought, fuck it, I'm too old to swing around a tree with a chainsaw swinging around my <laughs> neck. I'm going to cut off a limb. I don't want to do this anymore. I thought I'd become a writer. And I remember, I think, I'll be writing amazing travel stories. Um, I came back and I told my dad, and my dad said, you can't read and you can't write. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, you might have a point there. <laughs> Technical, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but he said, you know, you, yeah, yeah, I do, yeah, what about photography? You know, oh, that's more, isn't that more at the street? And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right there. It is actually, yeah, that is a medium I can get my, my head round. So I did an A level evening class. And, um, and then my tutor said, why don't you do a, a degree course? And I thought, I've got no qualifications, I can't do that. Luckily, in this enlightened country, as a mature student, you could get a grant. You didn't need qualifications, it was just. I was judged on my portfolio, um, and I got accepted. But it wasn't until I actually got into this institution where people like Anne Williams, who still works here now, and the tutors talking about, you know, what does an image mean? What do you do with your images? Where do you place it within society? Can you change meaning? Can you, can you represent people? Can, you, can it become propaganda? Can it, can it undermine people? Can you abuse people? Can you exploit people? What are you talking about? You know, I just want to take pictures and make money. You know, that's that's where I came when I started here. But at that time, when I was 23, I think I started here. I'd been out of school for nearly 10 years. I left school at 15. I was desperately hungry for education. So you know, I was you know I was taking an apple to Anne's desk every day, um, <laughs> and she would give me a book, a reading list. I don't know if students ever heard of reading this, but I actually read it. You know, I was reading all these books. It's, it's like, interesting wow. that you said that yeah. you, you first wanted to be a writer, yeah. because it, it seems to me that there's always been an element of storytelling in your work. Yeah, and that's in many ways that's what you do. Almost not not of fables and fairy tales, but that you are presenting stories, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, that's very important for me. I, I, I do see the world as, as a narrative and the stories around me. I, I see people's lives as being incredibly, incredibly important. And photography is great for that. You know, this picture here, you know, it's a, it's a, a clip from a Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, um, but for my Midsummer Night's Dream, I set it in uh, um, an Afro-Caribbean community group in Hackney that goes to Notting Hill Carnival every year. So the fairies are actually the samba dancers. Um, so I, I see that I see these these stories acting out around me, and the beauty of photography is that uh, you get an insight into a, a fixed moment within a narrative, and then as a viewer, the wonder of it is that you can imagine what happened before and what happened afterwards, which I really love. So you give someone a part of a story, but you had to work so much harder to to build on that. How important is your ability to get on with people? I mean, it seems to me that on the one hand, photography is a very technical business and it's about the, the cameras and it's light and it's film and it's all of those things. But equally importantly is the ability to communicate with the people that you're photographing. Yeah. That seems to me to be one of the things that's very central to what you do. Yeah, it, it's totally vital, I think. Um, and it, yeah, and that's something which you learn. I mean, uh, students do find it really hard to to go up to people and ask permission to take a picture. It's almost like going to the, to the disco when you're 15, <laughs> seeing the lovely, pull a lovely girl, yeah. pull a girl or a boy, or whatever, whatever it is, is yeah. um, going across and saying, can I have this dance? And you're terrified of that rejection. And it is like that when you start taking pictures, you're terrified of rejection. So lots of photographers get big lenses and try and put themselves further and further back from their subjects. Um, and through time, I've built up this confidence but I do love people. 
I, know, I, do, I am very much a, I do love to converse with people and relaxing with people. And it is that, that, this, that, that dialogue between someone where the longer you t- spend with people, the more you get out of it, which is very important. Is that why do you think at the beginning, and, and actually throughout your career, you photograph people who are your community, if you like, in, in various forms, whether that's the people who live on the same squats or the same council estates or in Hackney or, you know, in the buses, out in the fields, because you could develop a relationship with those people. Yeah, I, 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 yeah that is definitely part of it. Um, but at the same time, actually, it is nice to jump out of it now and again, which I, I don't do very often, because I do feel as though by staying in one place for so long, I've got... It's peeling the, the onion, isn't it? You, yeah. The more you layers take you back peel, the layers, don't and you? it gets more and more and more and more interesting. Everyone says, "Oh, you must be bored of Hackney by now," you know. <laughs> but you know, you get bored because you know, how many was it? I can't remember. Was it five hundred thousand people live in Hackney, for example? So that's five hundred thousand stories that are living at the moment. Let alone their people who their forefathers who died before them, and the young ones just about to come out. So there's all these stories. So. Um, it is great to be able to have... It's, the time is great. When I first did my picture of the woman reading possession order, yeah. of the, uh, which went on to the, uh, won the National Portrait Award in, in the National Portrait Gallery, I spent a whole day with my neighbour. She lived next door to me. And it was that. It was having the people around me, having that dialogue. And they realised, you know, I wasn't taking the piss out of them. I was there on the same agenda. I was trying to represent her, myself working together as a collaboration, trying to get um, a message across. So I was using it as a propaganda message. I mean, that, that day, or two days, or three days, was very important. That, that time. picture in particular, and many of the pictures, I think, from that era, seem to me to have real echoes to, I don't want to sound pretentious here, but to the, the paintings of, of grand masters. And, you know, I look at it and I see a Vermeer. Or I see, yeah. Were you conscious of that? Yeah, I mean, they are, they are actually direct references to Vermeer. That, that's, that was a, a I didn't big... know that. I did well okay. with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, yeah, and that's, that's one of the things I think that works so well. When you see that picture, hopefully you just see it as a beautiful picture. And that's that first layer. When you see it, you think, oh, there's a beautiful girl, beautiful baby, and that's just a nice picture. And then it looks familiar somehow. It's, you know, we've so got it in our, you, in our DNA. So how, I don't mean contrived yeah. in a negative sense, yeah. but how set up is that? Talk us through the, you know, the, the, the process of a picture like that. Well, for that, that series, it was um, getting that, that connection with, with um, Vermeer. So it, for me, it was like feeling as though we were in a small village, a small town. Vermeer was in Delft. He was a political propaganda painter. He was fighting for the Republic of Holland, fighting for the liberation of Holland against the Republic of Spain. He was trying to represent the ordinary people of Holland, as in the only people representing fine art painting were the kings and queens and generals. Um, so I, I put myself in his headspace in a way. So I said, right, we are the new kings and queens. We, are, we want to elevate our status. We want to have the status equal to the other people around us in Hackney. We would be called, and we were being referenced as dirty squatters who shouldn't be living in this area. And I wanted to put ourselves on an equal footing to everyone else. So I was taking those postures, taking those settings that Vermeer used, taking, echoing his, his pictures to use that, that, um, that status. So the first, one of the first things was actually to buy the Vermeer book and just go around to neighbours' friends, have the cups of tea, watching the, the northern sunlight coming through at 11 o'clock and saying, oh, right, at 11 o'clock, it comes through at that angle, which will be hitting that table. Look at this picture. There's, there's something about the light that's coming through in that same sort of space. Which picture, which subject in Vermeer's painting would you, do you resonate with in a way? So it would start with that conversation, and Philippa, the girl reading the possession order, she thought that was really interesting, that, that, um, that painting. She had a young baby. We talked about replica... Uh, representing the bowl of fruit from Vermeer and changing it with the baby. So it was a big dialogue, and then it was moving things around, shifting things. Do we use tablecloths? Do we use dressing? Do we strip it right back to what photography is great at, as in it shows the reality of a real place, a real squat at a real time? So it's staged, but there are documents of a real squat, of a real person facing eviction in real time. Have you gone from a small camera to a big one yet by this stage? Yeah, I had, yeah. So was that a conscious decision? Yeah, well, it, it, was, it was by accident. So it's, it's, an, it's in the, 
an evolution of, of how you work. So funny enough, the reason why I started shooting on the big camera is actually to make my model. So I've made this 3D photographic model of the houses this high um, to document the houses before they were bulldozed. Um, and I thought the great way to do that would be use these large format negatives, five inches by four inches negatives, put them inside the model and backlight them. There's nothing more beautiful than a 5.4 transparency on a light box. They are the most glorious, beautiful things that you can ever imagine. You look at your computers and your iPads, they're crap. Forget about all that. It's the transparencies on light box are amazing. It's like you imagine yourself being the peasant, walking across miles and miles and miles of the Somerset levels, wading through bog land, wading through the water, the floods, through the sewage, and then getting to Wales Cathedral, going into there as the beams of light go through that stained glass windows. It's like, wow, the magic, you're transported to a different world. And that's what it's like when you get your transparencies back, these large transparencies, you put them on your light box and you see your mates in squats in Hackney. <laughs> I was that peasant in that cathedral. And it was a transforming moment. So how do you take those transparencies and then you present them to people? You make prints, they're crap. Ah, oh, fuck, it's so frustrating. So for me, by placing them in the model and putting lights behind them, it got some of that magic into it. So, and then I thought, and then when you get hooked on that, that, that drug of real transparencies on real light box. Then I thought, well, I've got to take the portraits of that. So then I started working in a completely different way. And then from rather than grabbing the pictures that you see upstairs, the ones that if you've, well, afterwards you go and see the show upstairs when I was running around my 35 mil camera, grabbing pictures, not talking to the people, um, grabbing and running and taking, suddenly I had to take this huge tripod, this huge great big monorail camera, lug it around down the street, go into people's places, clunk it down. And then there's a whole different thing. You have to then have a dialogue with your, your yeah. subjects. It makes everything slow down, doesn't it? Because it? it's totally, a long process. Yeah. Yeah. And this college is good, but I wasn't... I was good at doing the theory, but I didn't learn the technical stuff very well here. <laughs> I didn't go to those really good lighting workshops. So um, I missed out on those flash workshops, so I didn't have a clue. So my idea of dealing with bad lighting conditions, I was in no lights really, was to use slow exposures. So if you look at all my early pictures, they're all sitting down. You know, they all have to, it's like Victorian clamps on your head. <laughs> you have to stay still because people couldn't move because I'm using one, two, four, eight, 10, 15, 30 second exposures. Um, so people had to stay very still. So, and being a skint student, um, you had to say, please don't move because that will cost me two pounds. And that's like, <laughs> That's like baked beans for a week, you know, that's your food money for a week. So at some, you are governed by your materials and your at, techniques. At some point, though, you went from being a skint student to being kind of recognised. And, you know, people are buying your work and it's in, going in museums and you're winning awards and all of that sort of stuff. Did that process ever worry you that you might get distanced from what you were chronicling, if you like? Uh, no, no, it's funny, yeah, it did. Yeah, I remember the first talk I did was in 1994, 20 years ago, at the Museum of London, you know, that, that, yeah. that, uh, that theatre there. It's a big theatre. Yeah. Um, we did a talk, I did a talk. Um, my first proper talk to an audience, and I talked about the ghetto. They just uh, acquired it for their collection. And I'm standing there with someone else, and I'm trying to talk to the audience, <laughs> and I speak to... <laughs> and I completely freeze up, my throat dries up, I can't speak, and it's... It's absolutely terrifying, and um, it was a horrific ordeal, but I got through it. Everyone just felt so sorry for me that I did get through it. Um, but one of the questions came up, well, you must be, you're selling your work now, you're obviously going to move to Hampstead, you're going to be off, <laughs> you'll be jet-setting around the world, you're supermodels. And I thought, oh yeah, Kate Moss, I'll be with her next week. And, and um, no, it's never happened. Um, <laughs> I've managed to move 50 yards in the last 23 years. Um, I've moved out of a squat, but I've only moved the, to the next parallel street. Um, and I'm still dealing with the same people in the same locations. You know, I'm sort of working, as you know, on the Woodby Down Estate in Hackney with the people that have lived on that estate for the whole years making that film. And I've got no interest, really, in that. And I still feel incredibly how, attached what, to what's around me. So how do you feel about the, the commercial world of photography? Do you feel very alien to it? Or? Um, no, I, I do occasionally do commercial work. Um, I have done the Vogue photo shoot. Um, so we went to Liverpool and I, and I did that. And 
And it was an amazing experience to work in a team where they do it professionally rather than, rather than being a cottage industry. The cottage industry is a wonderful thing because it's allowed me to, to spend as long as I want on a project, spend as much money as I want on it and develop it in a natural, organic way. So when there's mistakes are being made, I can just discard them and move on, not show work. And that's been a wonderful way for me to slowly develop my work over the years. But then you're thrown into something like a Vogue shoot or a commercial job and you, they say, right, it has to be done on that date. We're putting £70,000 to it. If you fuck up, we'll never work again and you'll be, <laughs> you'll be out of the... Co- oh, sorry, this has been filmed. Enough. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so you have to get it right there and then. And that, that has been a really good discipline for me. Occasionally when I do these commercial jobs... I do find it really interesting to, to work with different people, um, work creatively, work with people who use hair and makeup, use different lights. So for me, I, I do, I do, I'm not part of a commercial world, but I have a commercial agent and occasionally I do commercial jobs. So I do find it quite exhilarating. I couldn't cope with it full time. I never could be someone like Rankin, another graduate who's a year above me at college. And it's quite interesting where he's gone full on commercial photography and he's made an incredible career out of it. Um, and I've gone completely in a different way. Um, and I'm glad that he's done it to his and he wouldn't want it to do me. But, um, what about coming yeah. back here to be on the other end of the equation? I mean, you were a student here. Yeah. And you come back to teach here. Yeah. You're now professor, yeah. Tom Hunter. Yeah. Yeah. How did that feel? Was that a da- daunting prospect, to go back to your old school to teach? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I remember going to uh, my um, uh, private view and I saw Judon Rodriguez there, who was my tutor when I was here. I said, Julian, you need, you need me as your tutor. You need me back. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you're right. We do. And I'm like, that was great. I thought, OK, <laughs> that's how you get a job. I've never been to an interview in my life. And, uh, you know, he, t- he talked to Paul Smith, who's my tutor in the first year. And uh, Paul phoned me up. And I came down and he said, yeah, great. We'd love to have you back. We got on well together. I thought, well, great. But f- uh, no. Um, <laughs> but, but oh my God, for that week or two weeks or month before I started, the dreams I had about that, I was like, oh my God. And then coming into college after being away, because I've been away for four years, because I left, did a project on the road, I went to the Royal College, graduated, did another project, got into the White Cube, and then came back as a part-time. But coming back was just all these ghosts, and then coming back, oh, this is horrible, you're going backwards, you're not going forward. It did feel really really And did you feel horrible. equipped as an educator? Did you feel you knew what you were doing when you started? That was, that was actually really good in a way because I didn't feel equipped. I didn't know what I was doing. So for me, when I panic, I think I'm at my best actually, <laughs> is when I start to relax, then it all goes uh, um, belly up. You don't, you know, belly up. <laughs> it all goes belly Choose up. Choose your body parts. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> it all goes belly up. So for me, I was so... Desperate to make it work, I was uber keen. I didn't ever had. I don't remember having lunch breaks for the first sort of four years of teaching. I was sort of so manically trying to work out how to do it. But you know, the tutors here were incredible. I was, I was with an amazing team of people, and I still had that that empathy. With I knew what it was like to do a dissertation as someone who's dyslectic, couldn't write and read very well, um, loved for visual language but struggled with a written language. Uh, I knew the pressures of trying to get a degree show up on the wall or in a space. I understood what it was like, you know, struggling to live in London. So, it, and I'd only freshly been out of it. So I felt a great connection with the students. That was really exciting at the time. So that, I did feel after, and Paul Smith, he's retired now, but he was, he's always been like a dad to me when I was a student and then he embraced me into the college. And there has always been that incredible camaraderie here. Which and is, do you feel... You've always seemed to me to have had a, a little bit of the air of a, a, a preacher, a proselytizer about these things. Do yeah. you feel that you're passing on kind of your beliefs about photography and community and home and all of those things? Yeah, yeah. Um, I hope not. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I hope that I, 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 I don't know. This, it's hard talking in front because my students are here as well, and I don't know what I've given them. I'm hoping that I'm hoping that I can. I can see the beauty in their work, and they... You don't they, impose your forms yeah, of beauty. Yeah, because I've gone quite... That's one of the reasons why I've got this show on now, is that, uh, you know, when they look at my, some of my work, and they think, oh, Tom Andrew spends a year taking one picture, and he's, he's so... He's so... Up, up his own... 
is so precise and so <laughs> clinical about his own work that he doesn't, wouldn't understand any other practice. So it was really nice for me to be able to put the show on up here where I've got 100 pictures, they're all snaps. Um, they're printed on the cheapest paper you could possibly print on and they're, they're not thrown up, they're all considered, but, but there is a beauty in that. And I love photography, that's why I'm here, that's why I'm teaching about photography. And I love the students' work every time I look on their websites or their Facebook or when they bring in work to me. I love it and I love seeing it. So I'm hopefully I'm not saying too much about my, I am evangelical about my own work. I believe in the politics of what it does. I believe in trying to change society for the better. I believe photography has a, has a, um, a powerful force yeah. within society. So I believe in that very strongly. It, but I think that, you know, if someone wants to do fashion, why not? Why not just, you know, have a superficial love of beautiful images? I, I accept that and I love it. That kind of preaching element. Is that what led you into to, to making the movie, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, it's um, a part of uh, what we talked about earlier, the narrative, yeah. uh, telling people stories, um, getting those stories across, um, the stories that I feel as though I'm a, I like to champion uh, different people's narratives, especially the, the people who haven't normally get a, a chance to speak for themselves. It's almost giving a voice to those who That's don't right, have yeah. one, isn't it? Yeah, I'm working on that Finsbury, uh, Woodbury Down Estate, you know, up in Finsbury Park, on the border of Finsbury Park and Hackney. Give, working with the, um, the Olders group, the coffee morning that I went there for three years, and them telling me their life stories, and they'd be able to get the money out of the Serpentine to fund the film so they could tell their stories. And so I just became the facilitator for that. It was, uh, was an amazing moment. I've had these amazing moments where I presented works to a wider audience, and I feel as though all I've been able to do is just tell someone else's story. That's just felt incredible to was me. Was it very different working in a different medium, like, like film, you know, moving film rather than, than stills? Very different, yeah, yeah. Yeah, going back to that cottage industry, you know, I've got total control. So when I take, you know, one picture, I, I know exactly what it's looked like. And if it isn't perfect, that, I don't show it, you know, it's, it's going to be only exactly what I show. I'll take it when the light's just right, when the place looks just right. I take complete control. Um, the next one, I think, is, is that woman reading woman possession order. And, you know, I've got lots and lots of different versions of this in files. I tried out lots of different things, but I only show exactly what I show. When you're working in the film, like it's like working with the Vogue thing in a way. You know, we have three, four days of shooting. We had a huge team. One day there was 120 people on the set. Wow. You can't say, I'm not quite in the mood today. <laughs> the light's not, not quite, quite, quite right. right. <laughs> no, I'm not inspired. Leave me, leave me. You, you can't say that. You can't play these. Believe me, I've worked with directors who do. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can't play my prima donna card quite right, but you have to get on with it. You have to make the most of it. And you have to work in a team. So... Uh, you know, the, set, the, the artist, directors, and you hope to work with a DOP, the director of photography, you have to trust other people. I hate trusting other people, yeah. <laughs> I am a control freak as well. I like having everything in my control, taking this picture, it's just me and her there, you know. I only take it when the day is right, you know. So that was a real, a real letting go, which was, which was really hard. Is it's it like wet? Do you start. want to do it again? Is it wetted your appetite? Or? It is. It, it, there's some things I love about it. I love working in a group and that camaraderie. Um, and after, you know, I didn't sleep when I did my foot, you know, didn't sleep for a whole week. You're up every night thinking about, oh, what about that detail, that detail? What about the food? What about there'd be enough tea on set? What about the transport? Would we'll be parking? Would we'll we be able to get into the flat? What about breaking down the door? What about, you know, all these things are, you know, I just become totally manic. Um, which I love. I like being manic every now and again, as long as you're not manic all the time. That's great. The, the hard thing I find is I'm crap. Uh, I'm not very good at writing. Um, You've done pretty well in that, I think. Yeah. Hopefully someone will read this. I did spend a lot of time writing and saying this. So hopefully someone will read it. Um, you have to write, the money to make films is, is uh, basically means you've got to have either a full-time producer yeah. or you've got to spend your whole time writing applications to get the funding. And uh, that I find really, really frustrating. Whereas my own projects with photography, I can still be a one-man band. I can still do my own projects in my time, in my space and fund it myself. And the returns can fund the next project. So I, that's, a, that's much more organic in a way. But yeah, if there's any film producers here tonight that have got any good ideas, um, 
150 grand would be lovely. I've got some really good ideas myself. So, uh, yeah. Talking of technology, and, and you know, clearly digital technology has come very much to the fore in the period that you've been taking photographs. Do you feel that you're an old-fashioned photographer these days? Yeah, yeah. I am a dinosaur. Yeah, I am a... Uh, yeah, who thought that? Yeah, still I, kind of enchanted by the, still the dark enchanced. room. I still, the... I still get my 5.4 transparencies back. I still look at my light box. I'm still transfixed by these material objects. They still hold them up. I've still got boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes, and boxes <laughs> of them around my house. Um, I've got a proper archive, you know, proper hard, real archive, which is lovely. Um, I still love film. Um, I think one of the important things... You know, when I, was, when I was at college, I used to go to, you know, shows at the Hayward, the Tate, all the different museums, galleries. We're so fortunate to be in London for these amazing shows. Yeah. And what is it you like out there? Um, and the main thing I've realised is you've got to be somewhat different than everyone else. So in some ways, being a dinosaur now is actually playing into my hands because everyone else now is using digital technology. Um, and everyone, I mean, I'm being rude in some ways, but lots of photography becomes very similar. Yeah. It's all Everyone's a photographer for, as well, aren't they? Everyone's a photographer, photographer they yeah. but every photographic print has a very similar quality. So by printing from transparencies now, my, the objects that I make do resonate with the audience in a very different way. And it does sort of draw you in, I think, and you are thinking, well, the colours feel a bit different. There is something slightly different about that. And what you're trying to do as an artist, is trying to capture an audience so they don't just go, oh, I know what that is, I know what that is, walk past or flick through an iPad. There's something about it which doesn't quite feel right and you stay just that little bit longer and then there's a chance that they might read a backstory, chance they might read the politics, chance they might get involved in their narrative. So in some ways, by everyone else jumping on the digital bandwagon, um, being a dinosaur might help me out. That's what I'm hoping for, in a way. When you embark on a new project, what, how does it begin for you? Is it an idea? Is it a moment? Is it an image or what? Yeah, it's, it's everything, really. It's been alive and it's been, been listening to the radio. It's going to the cinema. It's been down the pub having a, having a pint with someone and hearing their story. It's cycling along and seeing a, demolish, a demolition of a synagogue or an old pub, you know. There's dialogues are just coming at you all the time. It's funny you, were, you used the word tribal very early on when you were discussing our youth, when, as you said, everyone was a, a punk or a mod or a skinhead or whatever it was. In some ways, it seems to me, you've spent your photographic like capturing lost tribes almost. Yeah. Whether they're urban tribes or rural tribes or youth tribes or whatever. You're, you know, whether it's just the people who, who gather in that one youth centre in or old people's home in Hackney or whatever it is you seem to be a chronicler of lost tribes yeah, yeah. is there a melancholy about your pictures do you think yeah I, I try not to be so melancholy I do love melancholia there's something quite wonderful about sitting with a pint of Guinness and a whiskey <laughs> in an old Irish pub and we're lucky we're so lucky the elephant cars got the Prince of Wales down yeah. the road which is still is an old Irish pub but I very rarely go in there by myself with a pint of whiskey and a Guinness <laughs> And think about the, uh, the old days when you used to row around on motorbikes, terrorising the local pubs. But there is something about photography. There is melancholia in photography where you're always harking back because that, always that moment has passed, which is quite wonderful. Um, I try not to dwell on it too much, but, yeah. I, it, is, I, yeah. it is inherent in your work, though, isn't it? It is, yeah. There is, there is uh, always harking back to something. And uh, um, these old stories I do, I do love and, yeah, these old processes and... The stories that people tell, um, I am fascinated by them. And uh, don't get me, don't get me in that pub with one whiskey <laughs> or two pints. Otherwise, I will go. Do you remember the days? Well, um, they're yeah. remembered in your pictures. Yeah, yeah. When you look yeah. back, you said you've got your archive. Do yeah. you ever, do you look back very often? Well, it's it's been an amazing year for me um, uh, because I've produced three three books over the last year, year and a half. So one of them was a big Hatsi Kants publication, a big sort of table, table top uh, publication which chronicles my work. And then the book I made um, of the show, The Le Crowbar, which is about just that journey 20 years ago when I was in the double decker bus. And then this small publication here. But to make all of these free, I've had to go back from my archive and I've had to dig out pictures I haven't looked at for ages. And it was, it did get 
pretty hairy at times, I must admit, looking at pictures, especially of the double-decker bus journey, you know. Because that's a, a lost world, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, and looking at these people, who some of them, you know, you remember that fight you had with your ex-girlfriend when you got your new girlfriend and she lives on the bus and you've got your new girlfriend just moving onto the bus and it's, oh my God, there's one picture of a girl looking at the camera. You'll probably work it out and you can see the hatred in her eyes <laughs> when we taking that picture. It's like, I felt physically sick when I brought that out for the first time. Obviously, there's moments when you see yourself looking slim and healthy. You think, ah, oh, I wasn't that bad once. But, <laughs> so there's a bit of that going on. But, but it's, yeah, the dreams get really messed up. And it is, it is a weird... Because you, you're, you're taken right back when you haven't seen these pictures for 20, 25 years. And yet the photograph on the light box, again, you are transformed to that time. You remember what you're feeling at that time, what you're doing at that time. Your love life, your emotional life, that old baggage gets regurgitated. It makes you feel sick. Happy, <laughs> suicidal, <laughs> all, it all comes up. It's, a, it's an emotional roller coaster. So it's been, it's only now, probably today, that I'm actually feel slightly relieved about the whole process. And you feel slightly less nervous now, Tom? You were a wreck less, when I arrived doing the same thing. Yeah. I mean, as I've, as I've said this many times before, having an exhibition is like, you know, standing up in front on the, like today and just taking all your clothes off and say, here I am! You know, you, You've been working on something for a long period of time. You put all your energy into it, physical and mental energy. And you're thinking, this thing is really important. I want to tell people this and people to understand what I'm talking about. And then you, you present it. And then what do they say? That's stupid. What's it all about? <laughs> so you're incredibly vulnerable putting old work up or new work up. So it's, it, is a, it is a really... Quite a strange business, you know, having the show at the National Gallery, 650,000 people saw that. There was lots of media attention. It was really, oh, God, I didn't quite know how to deal with that. I ran away to Ireland for six months after that. <laughs> having the show at the Saatchi Gallery, that was really something else. I just, you know, I, I didn't know how I got completely hammered that night to deal with it. And someone had to carry me and chuck me into a taxi <laughs> to get me home. I just didn't know quite how to deal with that exposure and all these people going, oh, these wonderful pictures. It's, oh, yeah, it is quite a strange business. As a photographer, you hide behind the camera. You don't want to be out there. You're presenting other people's stories. You're a storyteller, but you hide behind the veil, the curtain. But in an exhibition, that veil gets pulled back and you're exposed and your belly looks a bit like a pot belly. Your legs are a bit cronky. <laughs> you do look a bit weird up there. And it's, it's a strange business. Well, Professor Tom Hunter, we've exposed you a little so far this <laughs> evening. And I think it's your turn. I've spoken to Tom for three quarters of an hour. We've got 15 minutes left. And I'd like you to ask some of the questions. We have a microphone. So stick your hand up. Who's going to be first? Don't be shy. Um, who's going to take the first question? Come on. There you go. There's a, a, a gentleman there. A lady there. Sorry. Definitely a lady. Okay, this is a bit of a spontaneous question. I haven't really thought this through, Tom. Um, but you talked about your childhood and leaving school at 15 and then the experience of coming into higher education at 23. Um, I'm not in education, so it might be a bit controversial to ask, but what are your thoughts in terms of tuition fees and how that's going to actually impact on the dinosaurs of the future? Like, are we, are we restricting the kinds of voices that are going to come through as creative practitioners and I just wondered if you had any thoughts or observations about um, education today and maybe some of the um, strictures that um, teaching professionals are encountering today. Yeah, um, there's so many, so many parts to that, it's quite a tricky, tricky uh, nut to crack in a way. It is definitely a sad thing that um, tuition fees have been uh, imposed on, on this generation and they have to face the debts. Um, funny enough, in some ways, it's, you know, it, there is, there, 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 it's easy for me to say it's terrible, but for the generation, a new generation, it, it isn't. And already it's, it's a norm, um, which is quite strange, so I don't think don't think that's affected in a way. So I still think we still get lots of students and everyone feels it's the norm to go to university. Um, and university is an incredibly liberating 
uh, experience to have that time out of commercial pressures and to be able to think and to be able to experiment, to be able to play, to be able to be out of your hometown, to be with a new generation of people where you think about the same subject and you're excited about the same sort of ideas is a mind-blogging, a mind-boggling, a mind-blowing opportunity. And it is brilliant that the previous government and this government want to open up to more people. Um, but how can we afford it is, is, is a major problem. Um, we've got... Could you have done yeah. what you did without, without coming here as for a full-time education? No, I'd be a completely different person. I did a thing for Radio Free and uh, I did this talk and he said, your whole life is all about education. It's uh, my life changed, you know. I was a working class oik with a chainsaw and education changed me to become a middle class <laughs> professor. Um, <laughs> I've become intelligent and I can sneer at the best of them now. You're even better um, looking now. And even better looking than I was before. Um, all the tattoos have gone from my forehead and my knuckles. Um, so I look respectable. I've even got a suit on, which is, which is uh, interesting. Um, so it is... But I, I, I do worry, you know, it's having that debt when you leave college is a, is a big burden. So the freedom that we were talking about in the pub before we got here, yeah. when we left... In the 80s, it was a known fact that you would leave college, you'd leave school, and you would go on the dole, and there was no future, as the Sex Pistols say, and your shopping dream, your future dreams, your shopping scheme, you know. It's, but that wasn't depressing. No, it was actually very liberating. It was quite liberating. We were actually, hey, I don't care, I won't do anything. I live in a squat, I just do what I want to do, I just make my own practice. Now, the whole culture has changed. So the culture is to, you've got to get a job, you've got to get a, a house. So the expectation is so much more higher. So it's, it's almost impossible to say that's good and that's bad because culture changes. It's almost like saying to David Bailey, oh, you sexist pig. <laughs> yes, there was a lots of sexist stuff around in the 60s, but to look back on it is actually to say everyone was wrong in that period. Well, yeah, they were wrong, but you can't... You can't impose the morality impose, of now, can you? You can't go back into that time and look at it that way. So it's, it is quite strange. Um, yes, if I was, if I was uh, the new Minister for Education and you would vote me into the next government, I would stop uh, these, these tuition fees if I could possibly help it. I think it would help, but I can't see us going backwards now. And, um, yeah, it, it, is, it is problematic. Yeah. Another question. Come on, otherwise I'm going to have to keep asking them. Uh, lady here. Um, I was thinking about what you were saying about Tom's work, kind of, you know, being interested in these kind of tribes, and I see your work also as being kind of showing a lot of the changes that, like, Hackney and London are going through, and the ways in which that's, like, you know, there's a lot of social transformation in the city, and um, I was wondering if that's, like, an ongoing area that you continue to work on seems it seems to be such a kind of salient topic at the moment yeah i mean yeah london is always changing it's always gone through these amazing transitions it's it's a beast that never stops growing never stops devouring itself expanding contracting devouring eating destroying regenerating um which is why we love it so much. I think that's why we're all here in a way, because it sucks to see and we get caught up with it. I moved to London for, I'll say, one year I'll do London, and then I'll be out um, 27 years later, I'm still here. Um, yes, that whole, that whole crazy mixture of, of high culture, low culture, popular culture, painting, working class, middle class, upper class, palaces, council estates, pubs, theatres, Expensive restaurants, greasy spoon cafes, all, you know... Cheek by jowl. Cheek by jowl, fighting each other, you know, in, in a way, aren't they? It's just, it's that tension that we love. So hopefully I can keep on documenting it. You do run up against brick walls every now and again. You go, oh, why am I doing this? It's all wrong. It's, and then you take a time out. And, and uh, I think this, this period I've gone through at the moment, the last exhibition I had was on the, the standing stones of the West Countries. I've almost gone back to my roots but I think you do need to step outside every now and again and reevaluate what you've done. And it sort of takes something like you know, Robert to point out what I've done. So I realize, oh, yeah, or yourself 
to realise what you've done so you can actually readdress it again and, and keep on working. So, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not moving off to um, Berkshire um, because it's flooded. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not this week, not anyway. Not this week. So um, I do want to, you know, the place I love is Hackney. My, you know, I, I'm, you know my, my kids are here. They're growing up here, so all that's going on now. So there's all that stuff going on. Do you on, photograph cause... your family? Um, I, I, I got a little digi snap, so I do that on, on, on for Facebook. But not more kind of... But I haven't really done it. I've just bought myself even more a dinosaur, a bit of kit, a 10-8 camera, so the really big negatives. So I've got loads of film that I bought... 15 years ago, so I've just started to take pictures of my kids with that. So I really want to start to go really, really backwards. So pinhole technology, 10-8 <laughs> negatives. Everyone else is zooming forward with their digital technology. I'm sliding back into the abyss of time. Yeah, I'll be back to, uh, oh, has anyone seen the, the, the cruds? I watch all these kids' films now. The cruds, the way they make films, take photographs of themselves, is they have this, some sort of trap going on and they stand up and the rock smashes against their faces and leaves an imprint. So I think um, <laughs> that's what I'm going to be doing next. So if anyone wants to come to my studio and have a big rock smashed against your face for an imprint, I think that could make a beautiful project in a, a nice West End gallery. There was another hand raised behind you. Yeah. Uh, uh, lovely shots, Tom. Um, I wondered, you said you used to use uh, long time exposures on your um, large format camera. Have you since then started using, did you start using artificial light to, to stop that? And if you did, did it, prohib did it alter the way that the people reacted when you put artificial light in? Or have you always just stuck to sort of long exposures on your interior shots when people are involved? Um, pretty much stick to that um, old technique of just using available light. Um, in fact, the last series I did was of um, using a pinhole. I've done lots of pinhole stuff, so I'm using sometimes three quarter of an hour exposures, um, interiors of synagogue, churches, mosques around my local community. So really, really long exposures. But um, I have, when I did the Vogue shoot, we took some... I borrowed... Oh, no, I shouldn't say the bosses are here. Um, I hired some lights from... Um, <laughs> Uh, some tungsten lights, and, um, and I've, I've, I've used some tungsten lights, and another friend gave me a couple of old tungsten lights. Um, and for the, the Midsummer Night's Dream project I did with the Royal Shakespeare Company, I used those, but they're not powerful enough, so everyone else uses flashes. And using these old tungsten lights inside, you still, I still have to use like 15 second exposure. So that's really interesting, you get these directional lights. Again, I'm using the wrong kit for the wrong for the wrong film and the wrong cameras. Um, and again, I think the pictures look a bit different than everyone else's. So again, by being not technically capable and not being very intelligent, <laughs> I've actually done something which has, has something organic about it and a much more accessible feel to it, I think. So uh, it yeah, can go in your favour. Um, yeah, I understand completely. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, the gentleman next. You haven't got far to go with the microphone. Tom, with the Palace for Us, um, you were reflecting back on a, a housing estate and seemed to be on a social reform movement just after the Second World War about creating you know, homes for, for uh, ordinary working people. Um, were you aware of the documentary films of that time um, from the 40s and early 50s around so the social reform movement about housing? Are you, are you, do you mean the, um, the government ones that they put out? I mean, kind of Jill of... Craigie's film, The Way We Live, and uh, Kay Manders' films. I have seen them. 46 so the... and 48. Yeah, no, I haven't looked at them properly, actually. I've, I'm, I've sort of seen some bits of them, and I've watched some of them, but I haven't looked at them in um, the proper research sort of type way, actually. Could you, uh, say yeah. something, could you say something about the research you did for that film? Because you, you were working with the people of the estate for quite a long while. Yeah, so, sorry, it's gone really cold, isn't it? The air conditioning has suddenly gone into minus five degrees. It's going up my trousers, I guess, Tom Wearing. Um, yeah, the, the main research for me was actually going to a, a, a coffee morning. So I spent three years with age concern um, making cups of teas for old ladies and old gentlemen on the estate. So every week I would go up there, um, and it was, that was the main sort of part of my research was to just just hear what people had to say and becoming relaxed and building up a dialogue with these people. That was, 
really important for me um, because originally when I was employed, commissioned by the Serpentine Gallery, it's like we want you know, your reconstructed photographs out there. But after spending six months of just chatting to them, I realised there was so much more to say about the people, about the history, about the estates, about that time in history when we did, after the Blitz, after the Second World War, we sort of rejected the old society and wanted to create a new society, a society of where we had a welfare state which looked after everyone, not just the elite, where we, you know, we would have a national health system where people got ill, they were taken care of, where people became homeless, they had a place to live. You know, the thing that we're almost dismantling now or we're sort of questioning very much, why do we need it? Why do we need to look after poor people? So that was, that was very important for me. Um, and spending so much time really did open up these things. And again, what I talked about earlier, frustration in photography. Can it do everything you want it to do? I didn't feel as though it could. And I really had to have these people's voices in. I mean, there are ways you can do that, you know, with, with still images and, and dialogue. But for me, there was something about the movement. The way the young, old people did describe dance, I thought, was quite incredible. And... I just wanted to see them dance again. So every time these old these people took me into this little back room I had and set up this digital DAT recorder to do these oral histories, they would describe their lives to me. I was closing my eyes and just imagine this 84-year-old girl as a 19-year-old going to the dance in Frinsbury Town Hall and swirling round a dance floor with her uh, husband to be, and it just conjured, conjured up so much imagery in my mind that I was, I was, yeah, completely lost in it. I suppose transfixed in it. Yeah. To be honest, we've got to seven thirty, which is the time. We'll, we'll, I'll take one more question. See, I told you you should have started at the beginning. You'd have got all in. <laughs> Yeah, the whole process becomes incredibly disposable, doesn't it? And unimportant. Um, a friend of mine did die last year, who was my best friend at school, uh, went to his funeral. And so we are on Facebook, even old people like me. We know how to use Facebook, some of us. I don't. Um, no, you don't. You're, you're <laughs> but uh, we were trying to find pictures of him, and there was one picture of him when the local fairground came to our village. Um, and as a friend of a friend's dad took a picture of him, and he was a skinhead at the time, big Dr. Martin's on, rolled up, the uh, tie-dyed jeans, denim jacket, tattoo on the forehead, big smiling face with a cigarette out of his... And he looked, that, that image was just, it's just so powerful and just talks about everything about his life at that time, um, where you've got 500 pictures from tonight. Um, and... And how are you going to archive that? How are you going to keep it? Because every time you change your phone or change everything, it seems to be lost as well. So that's quite interesting. And will you know what to save? Because you can't save everything, obviously. So the whole archival, the whole, the whole process of archive, archiving images is so complicated now. And when I took those pictures on the bus upstairs... You know, I had so many films, you know, I could afford to buy one picture, one roll a week or something like that, or whatever it was, and I counted each frame, you know. So even though it seems very random, it's actually, I am thinking, I'm not going to waste one, you know, it's one frame off a roll of 36, and you can't afford to buy too many. And you don't think about it, so you're not trying to sum anything up, you're not trying to make it important, which is great. Because you are much freer than we ever were, so you've got a freedom and a spontaneity. But to try and make sense of that is a problem, because you know, it's taken me 20 years to make any sense of that. And with, I've had to work with, with Val Williams to make some sort of sense of it, who's been archiving and putting on shows for most of her life. I've been working with Ben Weaver from Here Press to make sense of the book. 
And even, even now, I still feel, oh, we should have put that one in. We missed out some, or we've got too many in it. You know, it's an incredibly problematic thing to deal with archives, and it takes years and years and years to get your head around it. So, sorry? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was it the ten-year film, and it just it edits a whole your whole life for you now, doesn't it? Ten-year birthday of Facebook, edit out your whole life. So we don't need to worry about that. We don't need these editors and archives anymore. Facebook does it all for us. What a depressing thought to end on. Well, I, I won't. <laughs> I won't let us end on a depressing thought because I've only, ever, as I said, I've literally, genuinely, in my life, only ever taken one photograph. I took one picture of my mum when I was nine and it wasn't very good and I thought, I'm sobbed out, I'm not doing that again. And I haven't. But I don't need to because we've got people who can do it very, very well indeed. And I think we've been listening to one tonight. Tom Hunter. Well done. Okay, Thank you.